Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Hey, grab yourself a cup of tea and join us. So wonderful to be here with you, and I hope you'll hang with us. We've got such an interesting guest today. Um, the Lord sends us some wonderful, wonderful guests. And uh, this lady was here a few days ago, and I had a chance to sit down and talk to her in front of the cameras, and we're going to show you what she had to say. Her name is Jenna Ellis, and she is an attorney, wrote the book, The Legal Basis for a Moral Constitution. I, I don't know when I've enjoyed a, an interview as much uh, as I did that one, because totally discussed the Supreme Court, and I made a couple notes here. The things that have been before the Supreme Court, like gay marriage, abortion, Obamacare, and all that, never should have been there. The Supreme Court is supposed to interpret the Constitution. It's not one that makes law, and it's off the chart. And so this wonderful gal has written a book on it, and the information will be coming up through the interview, and I hope you'll take advantage of it, because uh, we need to be an educated society and know what it's all about. You're going to love Jenna. And I'm going to join... Uh, Wanda, in the kitchen, we're going to make chicken quesadillas, and these are baked. I think most of them we've done on the program before we do it on the top of the stove, you know, and flip them over and all that. And the taste on these, the, the flavor is wonderful. I've tasted it. You're going to love this recipe. Before I join her, though, please remember we are viewer supported, and I can't thank you enough for, uh, you know, when we get the mail every morning, it's just so exciting. And I have no doubt that the Lord has dealt with a lot of you people out there uh, to give an offering to this program. I encourage you to do that today. You can do it a couple ways. Uh, you can call our 800 number if you use credit card, debit card. Just call 1-800-229-0059 and uh, they'll take your information or you can write to us. That address is on your screen, uh, box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. And we will get it right out to you. All right. Join Wanda over here. And i um, going to make some quesadillas. Do you like them? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to start over here. I am usually on the other side. But this is, um, uh, this is a couple cups of uh, cooked chicken. It's already, already cooked. You can get a rotisserie chicken. Or this one uh, we baked and cut up. And then uh, two-thirds of a cup of salsa. So you already are starting to lick your lips. You know it's going to be good. Um, how much? Oh, about a third of a cup of chopped onions. And then uh, some ground cumin, uh, three quarters of a teaspoon. Lots of good flavors going in this. Yep, would you agree? Absolutely. Salt and pepper, a little oregano. And this is supposed to hang out for a few minutes and just kind of get the uh, flavors together. Okay. Uh, do you fix quesadillas at home uh, sometimes? Once in a while. Have you ever baked them like this? No. No, I haven't either. Mm -mm. But um, so you, you want this to just warm get up. Out of your way. Get all the flavors together for um, a few minutes and then Wanda Mm -hmm. I just sprayed. I'm going to show you what she's doing. I just sprayed this pan. I already did it actually while you were talking, but I mm -hmm. sprayed this pan a little bit and then I just buttered the just one mm -hmm. side of this um, flour tortilla. Mm -hmm. And then when you get your mixture in, mm -hmm. as you put it in, we're going to put some a little cheese, cheese in it. So you 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 butter one side. Yeah, well, just one side. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we're going to. So we're going to let this warm up a little bit? Yeah, yeah. It smells really good. I'll bet your grandkids will love me. I no, tasted I don't this. Know. I have some. Are they weird? Well, they're fussy. Oh. Like, some of them wouldn't like if the salsa is too hot. They wouldn't like it. Okay, this is mild because mild. Cause okay, you know me. yeah, you. <laughs> I'm with <laughs> them on that. They wouldn't. I don't know. Well, Russ is getting better. Dakota eats anything. God bless him. He just eats anything, so it's great. Some of the guys can take it. So my husband could just. He could pop those Lucio, jalapenos. what does he, Lucio puts that habanero sauce or something? It's like hot. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. I would be I'd, I on a, in an ambulance. <laughs> There's no doubt. <laughs> but okay. I think when you see what we're doing here. It smells really good, actually. Um, this would be such an easy dinner and so uh, 
It's got it's got everything, yeah. you know. You know what I would do with that though? What? I would eliminate the green onions. <laughs> yeah. And put them on the side. So if somebody wants to add that to it, they could. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just saying for me. She has a thing no. about onions. Well, well, every what? recipe we've been doing lately have had <laughs> do you, big onions. Do you in. use onions at all at home? I do. Do you? But I make sure they're really small they really and I make sure cooked. they're really cooked well. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I will not, and I mean I will not eat it. Mm -hmm. Like I made a, a stir fry last night for Dakota, and I was he cut up he cut up the vegetables, and I'm like I surely know I'm not eating any of that, and I didn't. Well, Dakota is her grandson, and he's going to be going back home, and yeah. she's going to miss him. I am. Um, I'm right. not going to miss him scaring me half to death. He loves to loves I to do know that. What that what do we do about that? The kid scares grandma there. Something's wrong with him. <laughs> it's his way of showing me love. Yeah. I guess. Well, he does love his grandma. We're going to. I know that. Okay. And then I'm just going to toss some cheese in there. And you uh, bake cheese these for. Cheese makes it all good. Just, uh, just a few minutes, really. Well, maybe too much cheese in that one. Um, Probably you bake them long enough for them to brown a little bit and that go. cheese melt real good. Yeah, we don't want to fill it too full. Hard. Okay. I have there we to go. squeeze it, okay. press it. Okay. One thing about these that are baked, you can really put them together ahead of time and just pop them in the oven. Yeah. So you can do we probably, have some that we do. It's in the supposed oven. to be finished. That is supposed squeezing out a little bit. Oh, are they ever gorgeous. Ugh. Here we I'm go. Looking for, here we go. Don't want to burn it. It works. It actually works. I There you go. I don't know if I can taste this on the air because Why? it's probably so hot. Oh, we'll just take a little corner of it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's nice and crispy. Yeah, which is crispiness is good. Mhm. Mm well, I should pick it up. I'm supposed to pick it up, but it's too hot. We'll be careful. Look at that. Look at that nice and brown. <gasps> oh. Hope it's not too hot. Mm. I mean, really hot, not from spicy hot, but mm -hmm. is it yummy? Absolutely. That's Arthelene's lunch <laughs> right there. Yay. This is one we recommend. We don't recommend all of them, do we? No, it's true. If it's not good, we, we sell. Oh, and you can, you know, put sour mm -hmm. cream. And guacamole. Yeah, guacamole. And all that, but. We call it guacamole. Guacamole. I've heard it guacamole. Is it guacamole, guacamole or guacamole? guacamole. Guac mm, I've always heard guacamole. Dan, what is it? He's not listening. <laughs> if anybody know Dan Wood, he's always reading, you know. Is it guacamole? That's the way. Thank you. Mole. Guacamole. Mole. Okay. All right. It's the avocado there. stuff that's mashed up. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. If you want this recipe, you can uh, just let us know by email. That information is coming up on the screen as well as uh, writing to us. If you don't have a computer, we'd be glad to get it to you. Mm -hmm. It's called Chicken Quesadillas. And uh, please, you're going to enjoy this interview so much with Jenna Ellis, so stay with us. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. It's a pleasure to have you again, girl. Thank you so much. Um, such a wonderful subject, and um, I'm just glad that the Lord crossed our paths. We're talking about your book, The Legal Basis for a Moral Constitution, and she was here a few weeks ago. I wanted to go over uh, one thing. It was uh, Justice Kennedy is our swing boat, right, we call him. Yes. This is what he wrote about the gay thing. I mean... This sounds like a soap opera to me, not a, a, an opinion. No union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. Excuse me for laughing. Um, it would uh, misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, 
excluded from civilization's oldest institution. And I, I would take a little leave there. Uh, you don't mess with the institution, institution's oldest marriage. But this was his opinion uh, on gay marriage. Like I said, it sounds like a preamble to a soap opera. So your, your emphasis, they're asking for equal dignity in the law. Right, and and what the this whole community didn't really realize, and what um, Justice Kennedy tried to focus on was actually redefining marriage, and it's not holding marriage as um, as so profound and so respected as as he seeks to argue, mm -hmm. but rather to um, to say we're not going to go along with understanding that marriage in Genesis two was established by God, and there were very few things about the institution of marriage that were solidified, but definitely it's between one man and one woman and we as human beings can partake in that but we have no freedom or flexibility to redefine it and that's exactly what um, it's the Obergefell v. Hodges decision in June of 2015 that sought to redefine it and to um, actually debase it by um, by just completely changing that and focusing on the emotion of feeling and love rather than the mm -hmm. covenant of marriage that as Christians we understand that marriage is. Also, when it comes to uh, gay marriage or homosexuality, doesn't nature, doesn't physiology tell you anything at all? Um, but that shows what the power that one person has. This is a justice who we call him the swing boat. Another one, uh, we have a law that's in some kind of disarray right now called um, Obamacare. <laughs> and I know people who have been devastated by this. They, they are prescriptions and doctors, they can't, they can't pay it. They just can't pay it, the co-pays and all. One man did that to us and that's John Roberts. I, I've often wondered how does he sleep at night? Mm -hmm. To think what he did to this nation, that one person, was that ever the thought? Was that ever the purpose that one person could do that? Not at all. And it was never even the intention that just a majority of this super legislature, the majority of, of the opinions on the Supreme Court could so sway and influence our law. And I think it's important to highlight that both of those justices, um, John Roberts and um, Anthony Kennedy, were both Republican appointees. Mm -hmm. And so even though we thought initially they would be constitutional conservatives, once you get someone on the bench, when they still have that power and authority to influence the laws of our nation and they are not held to any higher standard, they're not held to their actual job description in Article 3 of the Constitution, then they can influence politics. And so it's important not just to put the right people on the court, but it's important to take away that power from the court to influence our laws that is fundamentally well, how unconstitutional. Could we, how could we do that? So, and we talked a few weeks ago about the Convention of States project, and mm -hmm. one of the things, and it's conventionofstates.com, and one of the things that that project seeks to do is to take away the nomination power from the executive, return that to the states. There's also no constitutional mandate that we have to have nine justices. We could expand the court to 13 or to 20 and have a, a better diversity of opinion and have more people so that there's not that influence of just one swing vote. Okay, but if you have equal amounts like we have now, um, as we make this program, um, can't you come up with a real hung jury? You can, but that's where, as long as there's an odd number, then you still right. will have right. a majority opinion of the court. But what's important, too, is if we look at um, the, the personalities who have been on the court even in the last 30 or 40 years, most of them, if not all, have come from Ivy League schools. They've come from mm -hmm. a more federalist, progressive mm -hmm. um, agenda in their own personal ideology, and that's what the Senate confirmation hearings draw out, mm -hmm. rather than any attorney who is actually well-versed at all in law is fundamentally competent to interpret the Constitution. We don't need someone who is a jurist from a specific Ivy League school that somehow is a better and more competent jurist than someone else um, who, who is a judge even on a local level. It shouldn't be that complicated. Well, you know, they wouldn't be very busy if they only took cases that they're supposed to take. We talked about uh, abortion never should have ended up there, uh, gay marriage. 
And as I have understood the, you know, the roots of America, the government basically does one thing for the person, that's protect. That's yeah. why we have military and we have policemen and all. But other than that, what role are they really supposed to play any other um, issues that come up are supposed to be ha handled by the states. Am I correct? That's correct. And if we go back to the Declaration of Independence, like we did in um, and the last time I was with you, if we look at the Declaration that established and provided the authority for the Constitution to be constructed and implemented. Mm -hmm. And it specifically says that the role of government is only to preserve and protect the rights of the people. The rights don't come from government. Mm -hmm. That pre existed to the Constitution. We've only had the Constitution for about 240 years. So the rights don't come from government. The government is not free to redefine the rights. Our rights come from God. Life and liberty, the, the fundamental value that human beings have made in the image of God, that is something that the government is supposed to preserve and protect. And so any interpretation of the role of government preserving pr and protecting the rights that come from God cannot be inconsistent with God himself and his truth. And that's why our Constitution is only five pages. If you look at the constitutions of other nations... Obama cares over a thousand pages. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, and, but our five-page document simply articulates, here, government, is your very limited power to preserve and protect our rights. It doesn't actually define or articulate any of our rights. Now, the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments, they actually set down and enumerate certain rights that the founders believed were so important that we have to make sure that Congress and the federal government understands you cannot legislate, you cannot in any way abridge these certain very valuable rights. And so it's not saying, I, I like to tell my students, your First Amendment to exercising your religion freely is not my First Amendment right. It is my unalienable right given to me by God that the First Amendment simply preserves and protects. And there's a very, very distinct difference there. And if, if you just read uh, the quotes from the founders, God's all over it. Absolutely. There's, there's no question. If you just join me, I'm talking to Jenna Ellis. I wish you lived closer. I'd have you on just real often. I'll have uh, to come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love, we're, we're in the middle of a blizzard, so it's really nice to be down in Tampa where it's warm. She's from my home state of Colorado. Uh, the Legal Basis for a Moral, a moral Constitution, a, a book that cer certainly whose uh, time has come. You know, it just dawned on me because I've gone through your book and I've got a lot of questions and all, and I, I was real discouraged. Like, how does this change? It's not hard. You just get constitutional judges on that panel. Yes, and you get you get jurists who actually understand that the only role of government is to preserve and protect our rights, not government that seeks more power, that seeks to legislate and regulate absolutely everything, including the so-called right to same-sex marriage, the so-called right to women's choice, and well, all what of these about, progressive um, things. The right for a boy to go into a girl's bathroom. That's going to hit the Supreme Court, isn't it? I, I, think. I think so. I mean, it will depend on the Trump That's administration. And there, there are a lot of things, I hope, um, of the executive orders that Trump in his first uh, year, or even his first 100 days, will repeal. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but we'll see how well he does with the conservative um, just viewpoint. And it's not really an agenda. It's simply a view that we are conserving our freedom and liberty as given by God and that he provides those definitions. He provides the definition to what is my right, what is your right as a human being made in the image of God. If we start with truth and that truth is as the founders recognized mm -hmm. in the declaration, then we have everything that we need to understand how government should operate. Well, I wonder just how accurately, if at all, American history is being taught in our schools. Right, and there's, I mean, even in uh, my own, and I loved the law school that I graduated. I graduated from uh, Richmond University Law School, and, um, and it was wonderful, but, but even in constitutional law class, we're teaching our future lawyers in law schools all across America to simply look to the precedent and the opinions of the Supreme Court rather than to the Constitution itself. Itself, yeah. And so we're setting up lawyers to think that they can't go into a courtroom and articulate that the founders and our legal documents 
the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution point to the truth of God. We are founded on a Judeo-Christian worldview. And if our current Supreme Court doesn't like that, well, then you know, we would have to completely change who we are as the United States of America in order to and, not recognize and that. And that's happening. That's what's so frightful. As I mentioned uh, the last time Jenna was here, I would recommend her website is up, uh, that you get this book and you give it to some appropriate person. Um, maybe you know someone in law school or uh, maybe a, a history teacher or whatever. It would just add a, just such a rich, rich um, subject matter to what they're already involved in. You, um, you've outlined three spheres with divine law and that civil church and family. How'd you come up with that and, and for what reason? Well, if we look to scripture and we understand that truth is, and we have um, general revelation and we have specific revelation, which is um, the truth in scripture. We see that God himself within his truth and for his own divine purposes has created three spheres of government, the church, the family, and the civil government. And so, so we see that how God deals with each of those spheres is different and they're complementary and they intersect in some points, but they're also distinct in their role and um, in the way that they're all supposed to blend beautifully so that we can live in the most free society to discover and have a relationship with God. That's, that's really the point of truth and of existence mm -hmm. is our relationship with God. And so the civil government is not supposed to be over the church or over the family and um, in the ways that they are today. And that's what Thomas Jefferson ultimately meant by a separation of church and state. Not that they don't interact with each other, but rather that they're two separate and distinct spheres of government. Not that the civil government has authority over the church mm -hmm. or that the church has authority like a theocracy over the government. Well, you know, one thing we can do, and I, I hope we've alerted people because they're uh, there could be, within the next couple years certainly, uh, major openings on the Supreme Court that the church will really pray and get involved and, and get um, educated. Absolutely. I, I, hope we, I hope we've done that. For one thing, I hope we've made people understand how really narrow, a narrow authority that the Supreme Court has. Yes. And then they're, but they're bringing in all these social things. And, and they're expanding their, their purview, their scope on purpose so that they can direct the country. And, it, and it's very subversive. That's scary. It's very, they're not doing it overtly. They're doing it under this banner that they have legitimate authority when they don't. And so what my book calls attention to is saying, wait, we need to, as Christians and as the entire evangelical community, not just step back and say, well, we're going to retreat into our churches. Mm -hmm. We need to be educated mm -hmm. and then we need to engage. Mm -hmm. And so this book is not written to lawyers. Mm -hmm. It's written to the average person to understand what is, uh, what is happening in our world and then how can we then go out and make a difference and become educated on these issues and then ultimately um, have the confidence that we know what we're talking about when we talk about our constitution and the proper role of government. Do you think that uh, Roe v. Wade, which is the abortion amendment, uh, was that the first giant step into this absolute activism? You know, it was the first really significant step that undermined the value of life. And, um, and in Colorado, um, last year, we, we just passed the assisted suicide bill, which is another way to devalue life and say, if we don't want to choose mm -hmm. for someone else to live or even for ourselves to live, then we have that choice rather than understanding it's God who has already determined the value of life. Shame on Colorado. I know. It's 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 unfortunate that we are we are turning into a purple state when we've historically not been. But that was one of um, but there there was a lot of foundation and framework that laid the groundwork to make Roe v. Wade possible. And I actually go through that in a chapter of my book to talk about the significant Supreme Court decisions that laid that foundation really? since the fifties. I got a couple minutes. Can you can you name a couple? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at um, the 
Everson versus Board of Education decision. Um, this idea that, um, that, that the Supreme Court would be able to have jurisdiction over or, or be able to even recognize some of these issues and even be able to have those opinions. So that's what they had to do. They had to crack the door open. Right. And then we talked last time about um, Griswold v. Connecticut in mm -hmm. 1965, this idea that we can just look past the actual text of the Constitution and pull out so-called rights that are not rights given from God, and we can elaborate on those. So, so that, yeah, that's when that's when they decided it was uh, fluid. Yes, a living and basically uh, meaningless. Ultimately, mm -hmm. part of law is predicting on concrete principles, mm -hmm. and so this idea of fluidity basically is trying to make the Constitution as a written document completely meaningless. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I would like to. Um, we, we don't have time. I, I do want you to come back sometime because I wanted to talk about the sexual revolution, uh, women's rights, and, and the courts were very much involved in that. So um, that sexual revolution, I remember, you know, there was a song, uh, kind of a Western beat, but, you know, I've got the pill, which meant the birth control pill that women could be just as promiscuous as men and all of that. And uh, I'm not talking about the song, but a lot of that whole body of thought was uh, the Supreme Court was involved in. So yes, will you come back and see me? Absolutely, Next I would time love to. Thank you for okay, having me. Okay, you stay with me. I have a couple things to say before we have to say goodbye. Arthelene would like you to keep the following information handy. You may contact Homekeepers by writing to Homekeepers, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, or go to www.rippy.org. Remember, we always enjoy hearing from our viewers, and we thank you for your support. You can't imagine what a privilege it is for me to bring people like Jenna to you. And uh, she educates all of us, doesn't she? Don't hold me to this, but I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said that our system, and it's a brilliant system, but it only works with religious, moral people. And Jenna has certainly brought that to life in this book, The Legal Basis for a Moral Constitution. I <clears throat> highly, highly recommend this book. And it's so important for Christians to be involved and, you know, always make sure that you vote and you vote, vote on the platform, not the person. You vote on the platform that they're standing on and know what, know what the Constitution was meant for. Get educated, get smart, and join me next time. Remembering, there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.